Okay, right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a discussion about data governance and data quality, how to make them work for each other. As you can see, I am Sue Hins, and um, I um, have been asked to spend the next 25 minutes just chatting to you about this. A uh, quick one, I would guess, is probably to, to um, give you a little bit of setting the scene on what's going to happen. So here's the thing. Whether you start with governance or quality, it's kind of important that you start. You may not um, have a clear vision of where you're going and what you're doing right now, but that will start happening as you go again. And the thing is, if you only start with one of them and you don't take into account all the other parts about data management, you are probably not going to succeed because nothing stands by itself. The governance doesn't, the quality doesn't. So today we're gonna to have a little bit what to do right, what not to do, how to measure what we're doing, and then a few tips about getting buy-in. So with that being said, let's just explain who I am. All right, so me, I'm the proverbial dataholic. I've been in data for 20 odd years and it's, it's my love, love, it's my passion. It's the thing I like doing almost more than anything else. And what I really enjoy about it is that I can spend a lot of my time talking to other organizations, not only to help them to work on their, their data and improve it, but also to hear what they've done and how to get up and every day do something great. Um, I do, I work in the weeds. So you'll find that there's days when I'm actually hands-on in the data. And then there are days when I'm really at the strategic level and I'm talking about challenges and successes. And of course, we always talk about failure because that just seems to be it. My idea is that every single day, I wanna go out there and make somebody excited about data. Um, so that is it. I currently work for DNB, which is Den Norske Bank. It's the biggest bank in Norway. I am the regional data governance steward, which is giving me responsibility of trying to get data governance working in all our regional offices. To do that, I spend a lot of time talking to people all over the country, all over the world, and especially lots and lots of time in Oslo. Sadly, my trips to Oslo have been curtailed the last year uh, due to COVID and we are hoping that that will get back to normal at some stage. I would like to say that the opinions and the material expressed in this presentation are my personal opinions only. I don't represent any other organization or any other uh, person. These belong to me and me alone. That being said, they're pretty much often 20 odd years of, of work. So I kind of have an idea of what I'm up to. Okay, so let's get started. And what I am gonna do is I want to start with these two pictures. Okay, so these pictures are out of the Damer Dimbok. Um, the one on the left is from Damer Dimbok 1, and the one on the right is from Damer Dimbok 2. And as you can see, over a period of time, these have evolved. And initially, um, way back in about 2008, 2007, when, we, when it was first, sort of suggested that there was a book, a data management body of knowledge. What, what it looked like is it almost looked like there were all these things that you could do in data management, but central to everything was data governance. And although that hasn't necessarily changed and data governance is part of each and every one of those, over the years, what's really, really become important is to understand that data governance actually encompasses everything we do about data. So from that perspective, if you have a look at the picture on the right, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of foundational activities and you will see that metadata management, data quality management, bit of privacy, security is involved in that. But the data governance itself talks about the policies, the stewardship and the ownership, how to change your culture. It talks a little bit about strategy, ethics, data valuation, um, classifying your data and of course the data maturity assessment. So with that being said, although we initially have the structure of data governance at the center of everything, we're now coming to the point that we think it's, a, it's encompassing everything and that when you do something, governance has to be involved. And I think this is the point that I'm trying to make here today is that everything you do has to touch everything else. There is no, it's not a circle, it's not a slice, a pie and it's sliced into slices and it's like, okay we can go and do data architecture as an example we don't have to worry about anything else not true you have to because if you do it in isolation it's not going to work very well you're going to have problems with it okay so moving on and 
I must tell you guys, I'm a firm believer in making life a little bit fun as well. So almost every one of these, I've got a nice cartoon and um, I'm not going to talk about the cartoon. I'm just going to say to you, have a good giggle while you're at it. So what is it that we need to do right, whether we're talking about governance or quality or, or any of the topics around data? What we have to do is we must have a sponsor in the organization. That sponsor must actually almost be a bit of a mentor as well. And they have to be a completely passionate communicator. It's hard to talk about data without people going, oh, my goodness, here she is again. It's that data girl. Are we going to be bored to teeth? To try, try not to bore people. And to do that, we need to have people who are passionate about what they're talking about. And our sponsor has to be willing to get out there and talk about it. That sponsor um, has to also be trusted in the organization. It's important that they have trust so that people listen to them. And of course, it goes without saying they need to be respected. When you respect somebody, you pay attention to what they're saying. And you actually, even if you don't necessarily believe them, you actually are willing to listen to what they're saying to you. OK, we also want them to be well known in the organization. It's no use talking to Jim, the database guy who um, has only met five people because he deals only in databases all day. That's not going to help. He may be very passionate. He may be exceptional at his job. But since not many people know him, they're not going to actually pay attention to him. So have somebody who you know is going to make that difference and is also willing to make that difference. Second most important thing is to governance, the, sorry, here I go, balance the need for governance and quality. So what is it we need to govern? That's, that's a really key point. You have to look at everything and say, what is it we need to, go, to govern? And also we need to say, how much of it do we need to govern? One of my favorites is, is when big data became the newest buzzword, there was a huge amount of people going, well, we have big data. We don't need to govern it. We don't need any quality about it. And, and there was this, it's all free, it's open. You can do anything you want with big data. It wasn't very long before you started to see people going, well, hang on a bit. Maybe we do need some governance. Maybe we do need some quality. Just because we're processing 60 bazillion records doesn't mean that we don't need to be sure that they are at actually decent records and that there's quality to them and that they've been sourced from the appropriate place with the appropriate level of of. Um, rights and, and privileges according to that. So start to balance things to, to make sure that whatever you're doing, there is that balance. The other thing is, what is the quality we're aiming for? So it would be awesome, wouldn't it, if quality could be 100% accurate all the time. But here's the problem with that. Getting there is almost impossible. You know, it's why you look at quality and you go to, I really want to climb Mount Everest to get the quality. Or am I perhaps probably comfortable with Mount Kilimanjaro? Not nearly as high, not nearly as difficult, but it's a damn good achievement to make. So when you're looking at quality, decide what you want. And also decide how much you're going to do, because it's really, really difficult when you want to try and clean the quality of everything in your organization especially when you start looking at old data. So we've got, oh, we've got data in this database and we got that data in 2010. It's still great. It's still good today. Well, maybe it is, but also maybe it isn't. But if it's 2010 and you only use it for one thing, is that as important as something that you use every single day and it's still showing bad quality? So that's the kind of thing to look at. And of course, the most important thing here is to tie these to your company strategy. When you tie them to your company strategy, you start to ensure that they're at the right executive level to be noticed. It's all very well to do a little data cleanup on, on your address, your customer address, in it, as an example. But if it's not tied to the company strategy of um, improved customer relations or let's get more, let's get more um information sent to your customers, how is that really going to help? And how is that actually going to let your executives sit up and go, ooh, we did something, we found something? So again, balance, very core, very key. Thirdly, let's identify something that's critically important. When you're talking about governance and you're talking about quality, you need to start with something that will actually help you to 
move this forward where you can start to get a success of something. And when you do that, you pick a data issue or a process or a system bug that is so irritating to a lot of people that there's a lot of noise about it. At the same time, make sure that you pick something that you have the capacity to correct. Please don't pick something that's going to take four years to correct because by that time, your governance and your quality um, initiatives have gone down the drain because nobody is listening. Um, and the rule of thumb, something you can fix in 90 days. If you can fix it in 90 days, people will remember it. That would mean that in one year, you could fix four things, each being 90 days long. So that would be a really good way to start. And there are lots of little issues. Yes, the big issues are there. Yes, we need to tackle the big issues. But if we start with the little issues and we get success, we start to gather momentum. And there's this wave of excitement to do data governance, to do data quality, right? Of course, the final thing is let's define the risk. Let's define the risk of fixing this thing that we've chosen. Let's also define the risk of not fixing this thing that we've chosen. And this is where you get to go back to the balance thing. Because sometimes it's an important, it's, it's a big risk to, to fix it, but it's an even bigger risk not to fix it. And you have to weigh that up with what you've identified and the balance that you need to, to maintain. And also, what about your sponsor? Because it's important that your sponsor is able to speak passionately and um, it, you know, confidently about this thing that we're dealing with. And also have the confidence that we are going to define your risk and be clear about it. If it's a risk that you're going to lose half your customers because of this thing that's gone wrong in the system, that is a really, really core cool big risk. And that's where you have to say, well, okay, we can fix this. Well, stop, stop, you know, stop the bus. But what if the risk ends up being, okay, well, we'll have one guy in the organization not able to access this list that he's been using for the last five years. Well, is that a big risk? Probably not, unless, of course, the risk is, is well, unless, of course, the list, for example, is something really, really important. But that being said, since it's a really tiny thing, couldn't we put the list somewhere else and still keep him satisfied? So hopefully that all makes sense. OK, so that's what to do, right? What not to do. This is always my favorite. I've always got lots more what not to do than what to do. And again, please have fun with the um, cartoons. I do think that they're pretty reasonable according to what we're talking about. So don't over promise. Please don't promise the earth because you're not gonna get it right. Data governance and data quality are at least 20 times more difficult to do than you think they are when you start. So don't over promise, start really, really small. Make sure, as I've said in the previous slide, that you select an issue that you can get a reasonable, simple and quick solution. Go back to that 90 days. If you can bring it in in less than 90 days, woohoo, that's really great. Finally, when you are promising, think about something that needs both governance and quality because you want to start these two together. So make sure that whatever you're doing has an element of both. Okay, yes, we're going to fix our customer addresses, but what we are going to do is we're going to govern by ensuring that the system actually stops us putting in rubbish for the future. Win win. Two does a double win is a great thing. Okay, please don't create a solution before you've truly identified the problem. And that's something that we do make lots of mistakes about. We kind of go, oh, we think the problem is this. This is how we're going to fix it. Okay, great. Sounds fabulous. Then you realize that when you put that solution in, you broke something else. One of my favorite stories is way, 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 way back when I was um, well, about 15 or 15, 20 years back, I was working in, a, in an organization and they had a, a process where they had um, online people selling product. Problem was that the product was sold and the online person just disconnected, didn't get involved. And about 60% of people, 60% of customers weren't getting their products. So the, 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 the IT department said, okay, no problem. What we'll do is we'll put this data feed in and it'll feed data from here and it'll go to the end of the solution or it gets to the logistics team and it'll be solved. Guess what? All it did is make things worse. Effectively, it took me about four or five months of deep diving into the problem, which included spending time in the call center to find out how this team actually captured the information and drilling into every single system before I identified what the problem was. 
And the basic thing is they weren't being delivered, they weren't being not delivered because there was an address problem. They were being not delivered because the delivery instruction field that was in the first system hadn't been taken through to the final system. So when the logistics team was busy packing, they were just saying, okay, pack it and get it out. Then of course that doesn't help because are you delivering to the right person at the right time for the right purpose? Once that was solved, that process went down to almost like 3% weren't, weren't being delivered. And that turned out to be a really good thing, but it took a while. And it wasn't just a one solution, it was about five or six solutions. All right, don't get sidetracked by other issues that may arise when you investigate the one. Add them to your issue list, because when you get sidetracked, you take your focus away and it splits your effectiveness. So you start to work on something and then, oh, hang on a sec, I've seen, oh, let me start looking at that. So you almost put that to the side, the first thing to the side, start on the second thing, and then a third thing arises and it's like, oh, oh, I want to look at that as well. So it's almost like you're going after the ooh shiny is what I call it. I want to see this, I want to follow this, but you've forgotten the first thing that you've promised to tackle. And remember, you've promised to tackle it. So you've got to, if you don't tackle it, you are in trouble. You've overpromised. You haven't delivered. And what's more, your program, your, your initiatives start to look dodgy. They start to look like you don't know what you're doing. All right. Finally, you have to ensure you have enough time. Please don't do something and say, oh, I can fix that in three weeks. Again, that's an almost an overpromise. Make sure that you have enough time to do the job thoroughly. So look at your first your items that you're choosing and go can i solve this in 90 days because if i can't should i be doing it should i not be saying i can solve something else in 90 days this one is going to take me longer doesn't mean that i'm not looking into it what it does mean is that i've put it on the more the longer list rather than the quicker list if you tell somebody you can fix something in two weeks and you know you can't, or you find out you can't, you're in trouble because you've made a promise to them. You've made a, you, you've offered them something and you're not able to actually stand up to that. So please, please, please make sure that when you do that, you actually have a decent amount of time. And please give yourself time to breathe. You know, please give yourself time to breathe. You don't want to work 18 hours a day for three months getting this result. It's easier to slow down, to, to sm make it smaller, make the problem really, really focused and take those three months, but make sure that you have a really great outcome. You don't want to actually start with this initiative with, with, oh, sorry, could get there. No, I didn't make that work. What you want to do is you want to have these things. Yes, we solved it. Now look what else we can do. Right, so moving on, how do we measure what we're doing? So here's the thing, we cannot monitor something if we can't measure it. So if we don't measure it, we don't know what we're doing. How do we know we're successful? Well, we don't, we're just guessing, we're thumb sucking it, okay, and well, most of our data governance policies are more specific than because I said so. That's a really great little quote in that cartoon and I really enjoyed that and I thought that would be great. So be realistic about your outcomes. The work will be harder than you can imagine. It will be insanely harder than you can imagine. And limit your outcomes to no more than five. Five things is a lot to do. And very often you won't have a ton of people doing those five things. You will maybe have two people doing those five things. So that's two and a half things each. That's hard work, it is. Also, don't try to measure everything. Nobody's going to read it all. I mean, you've heard the thing about, oh, what do you do? What's an executive um, What's an executive briefing? It's no more than a page. Why? Because executives don't have time to read 50 pages. They want to see in one page everything there is that's really, really important. So let's measure the most important things. And you will also spend so much time measuring that you don't have time for doing. So, oh, I'm so busy writing my they dashboard, oh, I can't sort that out now, I can't do that, I'm busy. No, that's not a good thing. Choose your measures wisely. Don't pick unquantifiable or useless items. I mean, how many hours of work did data stewards do to build your business glossary? That's really, really useless. I mean, first of all, it's unquantifiable. So how much do you know? How much time did they actually spend typing in the glossary? How much time did they spend talking about it? How much time did they spend going to get coffee because they just couldn't get this right? What is relevant is to choose a measure that will reflect the success of the work. It's not there to 
reflect what the operational structure is or the movement of people in between your governance projects and all of that. It's there to show that you succeeded in this item that you took on. OK, finally, create a simple yet effective dashboard. Make it really eye catching so that people immediately see it. Make it available and make it very simple to keep updated. Don't make a dashboard that takes you three days every month to, cre to create it and make it work. Eye catching. I did a project um, again, it was about 14 years odd ago, and that project was to deal with an online um, business unit. And we wanted to actually look at their key performance indicators. We had those key performance indicators on every single TV TV in the room. And it was a big enough room, so there must have been 10 or 15 TV screens. So what we did is we built a dashboard that was a selection of 17 little faces. If the face was red, you were in trouble. If the face was yellow, you had the possibility of you being in trouble. If the face was green, you were in a good spot. And the first thing people did every day is they rushed, they came into the office, went to the nearest TV, looked at their KPI, their key performance indicator, and decided whether they needed to actually do anything or stand in the back of your of your daily stand up and smile. And if it was dread, you had to do something very eye catching, available. And it was simple. It was updated on a daily basis automatically. Some of the metrics behind it wasn't just daily. It was full real time. OK, so that was an amazing structure of keeping people really, really involved and excited about what they were doing. OK. Couple of tips, and we've got a few minutes left. So I'm sorry, you're not going to like this, but create a business use case. I hate them myself. I really hate documenting so much. I sometimes feel like I spend my life documenting rather than doing. But when you've described the issue clearly, simply, and in very few words, and provide a cost benefit analysis, you find that people are more willing to allow you to do something. When you put in your roadmap and a little project plan, it doesn't have to be huge, it just has to be small, it has to be simple. You, you find that people go, okay, that makes sense. Because what you've done is you've described very simply what it is that you're going to do and why it's something that the business needs. Okay, the other one, gather the best group of knowledge holders you can find. You need somebody from the right business section. You need somebody who knows the business backwards and forwards. And oh boy, you need an IT guru because at the end of the day, you're going to be looking at data. Data is stuck in a database somewhere generally. And when it's stuck in a database, you're going to need somebody who, who can access that and who knows what the stuff in there is. And that's so important. When you, have, when you make those friends, you keep them for life. And then someone who can help you manage the change because almost every issue that we come across is going to be some kind of change. So who's good at change? Who's able to make it easy, to make it less painful? Because we know change is harsh. All right. We also need to really know and understand the issue. Right. Can you create it as an elevator speech? If you can tell your CEO in less than 30 words what this problem is, you're on to a winner. OK. And can you tell anyone exactly what the issue is objectively? Don't get emotional about it. Yes, it may be something you're passionate about, but if you can be objective about it, that wins a lot of friends. Finally, be willing to fight the good fight more than once with a different set of expectations each and every time with patience, grace, and dignity. This is hard. You're going to have to say the same thing a multitude of times and often to the same person. You've got to learn to say it more than once in different ways to make it easier for that person to understand what it is that you're trying to share and you're trying to do. And you have to bite your tongue. You have to step back and actually accept that people are going to push back at you. This is a hard task. And when you talk the word governance and quality, they are they are kind of hard. They're, they're scary words. They're not easy words. They're not like customer satisfaction. Satisfaction is a good word. Governance is a scary word. Okay. So hopefully, I think I've managed to do this in just over 25 minutes. Seems to be that it's time to finish. And now I'm on to the final, which is, are there any questions? Thank you very much.